Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 13th, 2010, and my guest is Joe Nocera, New York Times columnist and co-author with Bethany McLean of All the Devils Are Here, The Hidden History of the Financial Crisis. Joe, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me, Russ. Why did you call the book The Hidden History of the Financial Crisis? What do you reveal here that you think is important for understanding what's, what happened? Well, I, I guess the way we were thinking about it is the following. In the wake of the crash, um, uh, in the wake of the crisis, uh, most of the journalism and early literature really focused on the events surrounding uh, the beginning of the Bear Stearns collapse, following through those hairy weeks in September when it looked like the financial world was about to come to an end. And um, we thought that the second draft of journalism should go back further and go a little deeper in terms of trying to understand, you know, where all this stuff came from. Um, What was the evolution that led us to uh, collateralized debt obligations, synthetic CDOs, um, uh, you know, the the, 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 the housing bubble, the likes of which the country has rarely seen, um, the growth of a subprime industry that was largely out of control, and so on and so forth, rather than simply taking as our starting point that this is, you know, that, the, that these elements all existed and then uh, suddenly, uh, out of nowhere, uh, it all blew up. And I, I want to say I think that's a very uh, fair characterization of the book uh, as, as, uh, as, a, as the non-author of the book. I can say that's a nice – that's a really important and nice point. I, I do – I agree a lot of – so-called histories of the crisis seem to have started around March of 2008. Right. And you do a really superb job in the book weaving together the things you just mentioned, the push of home ownership, uh, the birth and growth of securitization, which most Americans have n- had no idea about even when it, when it blew up. Uh, and still, of course, we struggle to, to understand. And I want to also emphasize to listeners that the book does a very nice job – uh, explaining to a non-specialist how many of these complex processes worked and, and where they came from. And so I think that's that's a, a key part of the book. Uh, you start with the securitization process, which kind of really underlies a lot of the theme of the book, uh, one of the important themes of the book, which is the, the complexity and, and, and misunderstood nature of the securitization process as it evolved. But you go back to the beginning, you go back to Lou Ranieri. And so talk a little bit about what happened both politically and and in terms of of Wall Street to, that made that process get started? Well, um, you know, there, there's a bunch of different things. It's a, a complicated series of questions you just you just bundled together. Um, in terms of you know Wall Street, uh, Lou Ranieri and Larry Fink um, wanted had had essentially the core idea that if you bundled mortgages together. Uh, into a security, you can sell them. You could sell. You could sell them as a bond. You could sell pieces of them as a bond. And Larry Fink, in fact, invented the process of tranching, um, which was really important because it allowed you to rate some of the bonds AAA and some of them B, and so on and so forth. And and you created a a a, a ladder of risk, um, making thus making these bonds much more appealing than they had been previously to Wall Street, where you know, everybody had to accept either interest rate risk or credit risk or prepayment risk, and there was no sort of tiered structure of risk. Um, what's important to understand is that um, you couldn't just do this without the federal government passing laws to, for instance, exempt mortgage-backed securities from, from, from the state um, uh, what were they called? The blue laws? Uh, and why am I blanking on this? Um, no, it's in the book. It's okay. A bunch of state regulation that made it yeah, hard to, for... To, so that they didn't have to regulate every bond with every state, as was the practice at the time. Um, and, and secondly, um, 
uh, you know, there were tax issues that had to be dealt with. And, and thirdly, there were these institutions called Fannie and Freddie, which were powerful in their own right, and which um, wanted to create a um, system of securitization where they played an important middleman type role. Uh, and, and there was a lot of fighting between Ranieri and his people and David Maxwell, who was then the head of Fannie Mae, and his people over, uh, over where this power would come from. Out of this, these battles where, where Fannie and Freddie were sometimes aligned with Wall Street and sometimes fighting with Wall Street, you wound up with, with a system where for um, prime 30, 30-year fixed-rate mortgages, uh, uh, Fannie and Freddie really were uh, in, immensely powerful because uh, the most attractive uh, bonds were the ones that Fannie and Freddie guaranteed. And in order for Fannie and Freddie to guarantee those bonds, uh, the mortgages had to conform to Fannie and Freddie. And that's where the word conforming comes from. It means conforming to the GSEs, the government, uh, uh, the government enterprises. So uh, um, what you wound up with was a system prior to subprime, where, uh, much to Wall Street's dismay, it really couldn't securitize bonds, in a mortgage bonds, in a large way without Fannie and Freddie being in the middle of it and taking what, one, one, what, a, what a better would call the VIG. And the book really um, is the best treatment I've seen so far of the political power of Fannie and Freddie, which, is, again, was, is below the surface for most Americans – most Americans think of Fannie and Freddie as this cheerful, semi-private, semi-government agency that helps make home ownership more affordable. Turns out, most studies suggest doesn't make that much of a difference. But most Americans have a have a warm, fuzzy feeling about Fannie and Freddie, and the book reveals uh, just how powerful they were and their their lobbying. Well, they weren't just powerful; they were bullies. Yeah, and well, and that was sort of wound up being the downfall as well. Um, they used the mantra of home ownership to get anything they wanted, to steamroll anybody who got in their way. Um, and it wasn't just Democrats who supported them. Republicans did, too. There were very, very few naysayers on the, on the subject of Fannie and Freddie in Washington, D.C. They had, they had, they had local offices that uh, you know, basically counted practically every mortgage that they guaranteed in the congressman's district. I mean, they, they, they had, and, and anybody who was a critic, they didn't just criticized back, they went out of their way to steamroller them, to bloody them, to, 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 to bludgeon them into submission, and that's, and that's how they operated. Now, let me ask you a, a journalism question. Um, that's my impression, and my impression is drawn f- partly from my biases. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to have social policy done in the way that we did it through Fannie and Freddie. I don't think it was transparent. It was opaque and ended up being a rather expensive strategy for increasing home ownership. So, so I, I'm, it's easy for me to accept your argument. Uh, I've talked to some people in the business, some insiders, as but you've talked to a lot more. My insiders say they never, nothing ever happened that they didn't approve. All the the affordable mortgage stuff, uh, at least in the early days, as you point out, it was really it was good for them. It, they did, it, and they, they were if they had if it hadn't been good for them, they would have stopped it. I'm curious, as a journalist how, who doesn't have the same biases and priors that I have, I suspect, how you came to that conclusion about Fannie Mae. Give me the flavor of – and Freddie, who you talk to and how you – how, why you come to the feeling that they're bullies and, and that they were very powerful. Well, I mean we, we came to the conclusion that they were bullies by talking to people they bullied, uh, like James Bosworth at, um, at the GAO – who, you know, wrote uh, a study criticizing Fannie and Freddie and then, you know, was um, completely submarined in a congressional hearing where all he was doing was, was, uh, was saying that, um, uh, you know, Fannie and Freddie posed risks to the economy, which, by the way, they did. Yeah. And uh, that, was, that was, of all the things that drove Fannie and Freddie crazy, they couldn't stand anybody saying that. And, and anybody who did say that... Um, felt the brunt of their of their power. So we had examples of people who got bullied. We had uh we talked to we had people on the inside telling us some of the stories about, you know, how for instance David Maxwell threatened Lou Ranieri and said if you don't side with me on this, 
We will never, um, you know, uh, uh, First Boston will never get a mortgage bond from us ever again. So, you know, that's raw power. That's not even political power. That's raw business power. Um, so we, you know, we did it by reporting. And, and I, let me just say, um, in our conclusion about Fannie and Freddie, I suspect, um, uh, is not in accord with what you, what you believe happened, uh, what your biases tell you happened. And I was surprised at where we came out on Fannie and Freddie. And the reason I was surprised, and, but, but we came out where we came out because of our reporting, because we talked to a lot of people. We can finish that thought. So actually, I like almost everything you said about Fannie and Freddie, in particular, the fact that it's measured. It's not, you know, I, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make about the crisis is they look for one villain. Mm-hmm. Um, and for the right, it's Fannie and Freddie. That's two, I guess. You could call them twins. Um, you know, and for the left, it could be, it might be Alan Greenspan or it might be. Uh, right. And, and, I, and here's my, re- here's why I believe that's the case. I believe that the right finds Fannie and Freddie a convenient villain because it means you can blame the crisis on government Correct. and not on the market. Which is and the, un- left, the left wants to blame it all on Alan Greenspan. Or Wall Street, sorry. Wall Street. Uh, and Wall Street because, yeah. because the, the left wants to basically say it's all the fault of the market and, and not the fault of the government. And, and one of our points is that you needed both a, a faulty market mechanism, and you needed a faulty government policy to make all this happen. You needed both. Yeah, and I certainly uh, agree with that, although I have a, a slight disagreement we'll come to in a little bit. But uh, I think both the left and the right are wrong about Fannie and Freddie. The right says it's all their fault, and the left says that, quote, they had nothing to do with it, which is not true. But uh, they're both wielding their ideological sticks, and I think it's not very productive. I, I, think that's a, I, I would agree with you that, in that entirely. I mean, Fannie was not, they were not a victim like they like to portray them, um, but they were not the driving force moving the country to subprime loans right. that people couldn't pay Absolutely. back. Absolutely, and, and those of us who, who are friends of the market have to deal with the fact that Wall Street was the driving force behind that, and we'll, we'll come to that later. Let's, let's talk about the... Uh, failures of government oversight, uh, which are – there's a lot in the book about the failure of the regulatory process to do its job and how uh, attempts to to do – either to enforce existing regulation or to bring in regulations for new markets were s- torpedoed by various forces, usually self-interest. Um, what do you think might have done diff- – gone, gone, gone differently? Is, is there any point – you quote Hank Paulson, who conveniently says, oh, there was nothing I really could have done. It was too late. But certainly there was some point where someone might have done something. Did you ever feel where that moment might be? Uh, um, I, I, I is would – Is it Brooke I Warren? Would, is it – Yeah. You know? I would list uh, – <clears throat> I would list several things. Um, the first thing that I would say is that um, – and this is a point – this was Bethany McLean's insight really, but I, I – I, embraced it immediately. Your co-author. Uh, my co-author. Uh, her insight was um, it doesn't matter. The consumer activists were saying the subprime lenders were making predatory loans. And the, 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 the government regulators were basically saying this is what the marketplace is asking for, this is what people want, who are we to say what people can or cannot, you know, what kind of loans people can, can or cannot get. And Bethany's point was, who cares whether a loan was predatory or not? When you're making tens of millions of loans to people who can never pay them back, that's a problem. And that will inevitably lead to some kind of credit crisis. It has to. Um, And so point number one is that uh, the Federal Reserve, which does have responsibility over – does have a consumer function, and the OCC and the OTS um, should have been much more uh, focused on the quality of underwriting that was going on in the banking system. And you can argue, I know, that countrywide and, 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 and mortgage originators were outside the banking system, but I believe that the Fed, at least, um, could have had, uh, had more wi- wide, 
wide-ranging powers that would have allowed it to crack down on lending it viewed as inappropriate, which which never happened. So that's well, they, point one. They certainly had no compunction about expanding their activities in other places when it was convenient for them, so they certainly <laughs> could have right. done it there. And, 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 you know, the reason they didn't do it was because Greenspan – um, Greenspan was uh, an ideologue who believed firmly that um, all regulation was bad, that the world was a better place, and, 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 and he, he, this was just not something that interested him. And because he was so important and so powerful and because his mindset so permeated uh, the regulatory apparatus, uh, there was just no way anybody was going to do anything to, um, to buck his will on this. I disagree with that. We'll come to that in a little bit. So continue, okay. so, though. So continue point, point number two, uh, it seems to me, is that you have Bob Rubin as Treasury Secretary turning to one of his aides you know, during, I guess, the Korean crisis and saying, do we know uh, what the credit default swap, what the exposure to Korea is? Yeah, in the U.S. financial system. Right. And the answer is, we don't know. Right. <laughs> That's Slightly shocking. Aw- Slightly awkward, yeah. Yeah, and and yet, yet, when uh, you know, I actually blame him more than any other person for the failure to, at, at a minimum, make derivatives more transparent, so everybody knew, so the government knew who the counterparties were, where the danger points were, uh, what problems might be uh, arising in the system. They did none of that, and instead, they took a um, sort of where's they took the position that all smart people realize that derivatives make the world safer, not more dangerous. Therefore, anybody who says likewise is an idiot, and we won't listen to them. And when Brooksley Bourne came along and said, I would at least like to look at this stuff and see if there's a problem being posed, she wasn't, you know, they, they, they stomped all over her, to use the technical term. Yeah, she, she- she was the head of the CFTC, which is right. Futures um, uh, Regulatory Body, and and lost on a quote technicality right. that these weren't futures, therefore she had no say over. But it really was it, that wasn't what it was about. Right, and 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 ultimately, um, you know, during the um, during the tail end of the Clinton administration, uh, a law was passed that basically made it impossible for derivatives der- to be regulated, and a law was also passed abolishing Glass Steagall. Now. I have a somewhat nuanced, you know, I'm not one of these people that say, oh, if you had only uh, kept Glass-Steagall, everything would have been fine. I think that's crazy. Glass-Steagall was on its last legs anyway. Yeah. Financial innovation had outrun it. And one of the points that I've made often uh, in, uh, in the wake of the crisis is that the, um, the, the, the regulations that were passed and the, and the the, you know, the creation of the SEC and, the, and, and Glass-Steagall uh, really did keep the financial world in the United States pretty safe for about 50 years. And that, that's about as long a time as you can really expect regulation to do its job. Because inevitably, uh, financial innovators will find uh, holes in it or ways around it, and, and, or it will become outmoded. And that's what happened with Glass-Steagall. It, it, it had become outmoded. It couldn't last. Um, and, and it kind of deserved to die. The problem, the problem was not that they abolished Glass-Steagall, but they didn't believe that they had to create some other modern regulatory framework that could have both allowed flexibility and innovation and yet uh, um, kept, um, kept track of systemic risk, um, understood the importance of capital requirements, um, you know, did sort of basic things to help keep the world safe, and that's what they didn't do. In fact, the, um, the Rubin story, I got a sense of deja vu reading the book when I think Paulson goes to Camp David and meets with President Bush and says something about, I'm a little nervous about whatever it was, derivatives, right. credit defaults, offs, and then president or somebody says, well, how much of it is there? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. There there was a lot of ignorance uh, about the potential scope of the problem. And of course, it goes all through the system. There was a lot of, I think, a lack of awareness of of what kind of loans were being made. And as you pointed out, uh, whether that was because of the thrill of a homeowner being able to buy something with no money down and closing costs included – or the thrill of the originator who 
signed up somebody for something that he really didn't know what they were signing for, both slightly unattractive activities, it didn't really matter. Those were going to blow up. That's right. That's right. And and don't forget also, one of another Be- another of Bethany's many uh, great insights is that so little of this activity actually had to had to do with home ownership. Yeah. It was so much of it was turning your house into a piggy bank. Yeah, the re- refinancing phenomenon yeah. and the second home uh, lottery. <laughs> right, but but a big company like New Century. Uh, openly admitted that between 85 and 90 percent of the o- loans that they made were cash out refinancing, and and there were data on that that were yes. I think contemporary contemporaneous. Yes, there was but data. People and just John, didn't pay much attention right. to it early on. And Josh Rosner was one of the first to sort of uh, realize the extent to which uh, refinancing was driving the housing bubble, because um, yeah, he, he had that other great line, which is uh, uh, a home without equity. What is it? Yeah, home with that equity. Home with a hundred with home with the, with no equity is just just a renter with debt. Something like that. That's it's right. A, that's exactly right. He, he that paper, which I also cited my writing on this, is is I think the most. You know, everyone claims that so and so predicted the crisis. So that's the deepest. It was written in two thousand and one, right. and he understood not just the fact that we were starting to take on more risk than people were aware of. But he understood the ramifications of it. He saw how it was corrupting the appraisal process. That's right. He really he, he's an underappreciated seer. I'm glad you gave I, him. Some I, I I could not agree more. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about securitization. I want to come back to this regulatory issue in a minute, but talking a little bit more about securitization, uh, it's it sort of steamrolled partly through competition among Wall Street and Fannie and Freddie, but eventually you come to a world and you describe it. In various parts of the book with a lot of uh, zest and, and um, zeal, it becomes a process where a lot of people are originating a lot of really bad loans right. because they're being securitized. Well, that yeah, it, it's so uh, messy uh, what actually happens. Um, the subprime, first of all, you know, for many, many, many years. Fannie and Freddie would have nothing to do with subprime loans. They were all about the uh, the prime loans, the thirty year fix. They dominated that part of the market. So Wall Street w- Wall Street's incentive was to get out from under Fannie and Freddie. Um, th- now the second thing is that because the subprime companies weren't banks, they were entirely dependent on Wall Street both to make the wholesale loans that you know was basically their upfront cash. And then to buy their loans um, uh, once they made them, so they would have yet more money to make more loans, and so on and so forth. So, so they were, in some ways, they were completely a creature of Wall Street. Uh, one of the shocking facts to me is that Wall Street was actually ultimately dictating the riskiness of the loans, because Wall Street got to decide what, what loans it would buy and what loans it wouldn't. And what they would finance is, you know, and so as yes, as 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 interest rates continued to drop, as the as the push for yield became ever more urgent among money market funds and pension funds and 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 everybody who who wanted who wanted and depended on AAA securities, um, it was important for Wall Street to ca- to have ever more degraded loans to bundle because those degraded loans, you know, uh, generated higher yields. Um, and as you point out, it allowed the creation of derivative products, CDOs, and and mortgage backed securities that were AAA rated on paper by the rating agencies, which gave them ways to get around their capital requirements, or that, at least and, make and them that's more right. And, the, and that's right. And capital requirements is one of the is really at the heart and soul of the financial crisis. It doesn't get the credit it deserves because Basel is complicated and 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 it's just kind of hard to grapple with. But, you know, why were all the banks undercapitalized when the crisis came? The answer is because they didn't have to put any capital against their AAA assets because they were supposedly, quote-unquote, risk-free. Well, guess what? They weren't risk-free. So here's one of my disagreements I want to challenge you on this. They weren't, and and they made a mistake. Uh, That's the attractive way to put it. There was obviously an immense amount of hubris. Um, The problem I have with that explanation, although I think it's obviously true, is um, most of the players in that world didn't pay much of a price for that miscalculation. 
uh, they were insulated from their decisions by the bailout and by – and as they had been with past bailouts. So it makes you – I think you have to be open to the possibility that we have been subsidizing Wall Street's risky, risky behavior and help through public policy of, of bailouts in the past. We've helped create that lack of attention that they paid to those – the things they were they were buying. You think? What do you think of that argument? Well, I, I, which bailouts are you talking about? Long-term capital management? Uh, that would be one. Uh, Continental Illinois, 1984, mm-hmm. the Mexican peso crisis in the mid-90s, the savings and loan crisis. Basically, creditors, people who made those leverage levels possible, uh, if they came from a large institution, they ended up getting saved. And um, Listen, I don't, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, uh, I don't. I guess where I would differ with you is, you're at least in the way you're phrasing the question, you're making it sound conscious. Um, I think I, I would make a, 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 a distinction. Uh, I think that I agree. The, Say it better. <laughs> I, I, I think that the um, the fact of government bailouts was not consciously on their mind as this was going on. I don't even think it was necessarily subconsciously on their mind. What I do think was consciously on their mind, and I think what what was a kind of um, uh, almost overt corruption, was the um, short-term incentive uh, compensation that they got for making deals and then not having to really care, ultimately, whether the bonds turned out to be good or not. Yeah. and, and as we, especially as you get to the end, as you get to the end of the line and you're like a year away from the crisis and the truth of the matter is, you know, everybody's stuffed to the gills with triple A's. The banks don't want them anymore. The only way you can keep the machine going is to sell to short sellers, you know, who are doing this, uh, this complicated buy the equity short to triple A. You have to put the triple A on your own books. It's the only way you can keep the machine going. But you're making so much money for yourself, yeah. 15, 20, that, that you're not willing to stop, even though every, every fiber of your being is shouting, this is, this is about to collapse. Yeah, and you're, if you're Richard Fold or uh, Jimmy Kane, you're, you're maxing out on what part of your options you can cash out and putting them to the side. And you do take a hit when it collapses, but you've put away a good chunk beforehand. One assumes one assumes they did, it. and then and then you got a guy like Stan O'Neill, who's one of the characters in our book, you know, who gets pushed out before the crisis because of his mistakes, but walks off with 160 million dollars in retirement. Yeah, I mean that's kind of offensive. I agree. I, I think the, I think your point about the conscious, subconscious, whatever you want to call it, is important. Uh, but it, you know, as someone who's, I focused a lot on this issue of the moral hazard created from past what I think of as mistakes. And your book opens with this guy, Bright, who's the risk management guy at, at Merrill. And he's, he's suddenly out of, uh, out of power there. He's pushed, shunted to the back. And I think a lot of the wise warriors were shunted away because whether it was conscious or not, I think a lot of people realized correctly that if they all went down in flames, they'd get saved. So if most people were going to go down in flames, you'd be a fool to be prudent in the meanwhile. And I do think there was a systemic risk in that sense created by the, that whole Wall Street protection. Right. I, I, guess, I guess where I differ with you is I'm, I'm not convinced that they saw the, – I, I don't think they all – a guy like Stan O'Neill sat around thinking, well, if I go down, everybody else is going to have to go down too, so I might as well just do this. I think he just saw, well – Goldman's making so much money, I want to make the same amount of money, so I'll take the same amount of risk, even though it turns out Merrill Lynch didn't have anywhere near the risk management capabilities that Goldman Sachs did. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I think it was uh, – people were um, not induced uh, to be prudent for sure. Uh, to get off track for a second, yeah. I- I've always thought ultimately <clears throat> that <clears> – <throat> excuse me – so much of this could have been avoided if they just let Bear Stearns go under. Yeah, I agree. Bear Stearns was one fifth the size of Lehman. It, it just didn't have the kind of it didn't create the kind of systemic risk that Lehman would have. Um, you could have if, ba- if, if Bear Stearns had gone bankrupt, it would have woken everybody up to the to the notion that we weren't going to bail everybody out, and they had to get their house in order fast. And I, I, I think it I think it I think you might have maybe 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 averted the crisis if you'd let Bear go bankrupt. Yeah, no, that's – I think that was 
The wrong signal. It certainly and it's and basically other players who were like you say were bigger and had similar balance sheets but were bigger like Lehman uh, were able to continue to fund themselves. Right, which and, they and shouldn't Fald have been able and, to. Right, and Dick Fold in particular. I mean, he he. There is probably no better example in modern history of somebody uh, a, a, a walking talking example of moral hazard because there's no question that having seen them save their sterns he thought they will do the same for me. Which is not unreasonable. I, I've always... No, it wasn't unreasonable at all. He was wrong, but it, was un- <laughs> it wasn't unreasonable. I wondered, maybe you have some thoughts on this. Uh, you think uh, Paulson's uh, and, and Goldman's relation... Paulson, at the time, Secretary of the Treasury and former Goldman's CEO, uh, do you think his personal relationship with Fold, meaning not good relationship, had something to do with that? Did you talk well, to anybody about that? <laughs> Um, you know, one of the things we didn't do in our book was spend a lot of time on Lehman, um, uh, precisely because we thought it, it wasn't really Ill- illustrative of, uh, we had better ways to illustrate the larger point. Um, having said that, <coughs> I think that, um, I guess the way I would phrase it is, I think Paulson would have been just as tough on whoever was next in line with the possible exception of Goldman Sachs. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, good point. You know, because his empathy for Goldman would have overridden, um, I think, moral hazard. Did you guys look at all into the um, the phone calls between Paulson and, Gold- and uh, Blankfein the, at Goldman uh, the week before the AIG bailout? No, no, we really didn't. Um, you know, you got to stop somewhere, Russ. Yeah, no, I, I'm just, I'm just asking. Those are just some of my favorite. Th- there's, this, there's some other hidden histories to be written about the when, when the, when the uh, worst was in the air. Uh, and as you point out, your book really focuses on the, uh, on the lead up and the, the, uh, the foundations, which is, uh, which right. is plenty I mean, valuable. Right. I mean, as we get to that, I mean, we did a lot with the Goldman AIG um, collateral call dispute. Um, where we uh, were able to take advantage of hundreds of pages of documents that were released by the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. You talk about that. What did you find out there that was important? Well, I guess um, the way I would phrase it is AIG FP, Financial Products Division, was actually a pretty cautiously run division <laughs> that, that made this one terrible, terrible mistake, which was based in part on the risk models of the fabled Yale economist Gary Gordon, um, and in part on their own reading of the uh, of the mortgage market. Um, you know, they the, the collateral calls. The thing that most interested me about the collateral calls that I, I didn't think has really gotten justice uh, elsewhere is the extent to which Joe Cassano was com- completely misunderstood. Um, the difference between um, underlying credit risk and liquidity risk. And back up for a sec. Talk about what the collateral calls are and who Joe Cassano oh, is. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, we've been throwing a lot of names, but we've talked right. about all those well, folks in past podcasts. So, but not this one. So, try to explain a little bit. Okay. One of the one of the critical events leading up to the crisis is is Goldman Sachs' insistence that AIG begin to pay collateral calls on the AAA securities that it has insured with its credit default swaps. And what does that this mean? Is, this is what begins to send tremors in the market and particularly begins to, the, the beginning of the end for AIG, the way it begins to crumble, is, is uh, these collateral calls start, start, start coming. AIG has a view that it should never have to pay a penny in collateral uh, calls on, on, on these securities because, um, you know, they believe that these are, risk, these are risk-free securities and they don't agree with Goldman's assessment. And they get into this gigantic, months-long fight over this. And what's, so a collateral, Katana, what's a collateral call? What does that mean practically well, for AIG? A, colla- a collateral call is uh, an agreement by the insurer, in this case AIG, that if the security drops in value uh, in the marketplace, that they will make up the difference between the, with cash. They will okay. turn over cash to the counterparty to make up the difference in the loss in the, in the loss in value. It's sort of as if the 
the promise is underwater. It's like the homeowner yeah, who's got negative right. equity. That's yeah. right. And so um, uh, this, this, this chapter sort of illustrates the underlying tensions that were going on then between AIG and Goldman and, and this, this enormous fight that was taking place. Joe Cassano was the man who ran AIG FP, and he kept insisting over and over and over again that we shouldn't that you know we at AIG shouldn't have to pay a penny to Goldman because the underlying securities are fine and he completely didn't understand or refused to accept or acknowledge that it you know it, 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 it like everything else in Wall Street it doesn't matter what the underlying securities ultimately are worth it only matters what they're worth today and if they're worth today less that he has a responsibility at AIG to put up this money and um uh, this this took place over months. Uh, this this back and forth, and and there's, there's this constant uh, AIG putting up a, a billion, and then uh, you know three billion, and then five billion, and then seven billion, and it really winds up with AIG not just in crisis, but you know the reason AIG basically went under or had to be saved by the federal government is that they owed so much in collateral to so many counterparties. That they were dead. They're fundamentally insolvent, right? Yeah, they were. They were totally. They had. They just didn't have the cash. They so had. it's kind of it's kind of interesting. You you could view that as a right. One way to describe it is a run on AIG Goldman trying to get while they were still somewhat solvent, getting something out of them because they That's weren't right. sure they they didn't know they were going to be bailed out. That's right. Um, and Goldman, at the same time, was buying credit default swaps against the possibility that AIG itself might default, because they they kind of realized from these battles they were having over the collateral that AIG was in more trouble than anyone realized. So, they're they're the smart devils, maybe. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and you've got, as you pointed out a few minutes ago, I mean, it's such a, I think, an important, as you say, hidden history. The incredible role that Wall Street played in funding these subprime originators. I think that's totally not understood, uh, and that's so important to the point where Bear Stearns is operating its own subprime originator uh, through um, – I forgot what they were called, but they had their own subprime office to make sure they had a nice funnel. Well, it was vertically uh, integrated. Bear Stearns was you – know, Lehman, right. Lehman, Lehman had a very large originator. Merrill Lynch, at the tail end of the uh, O'Neill regime, bought an originator. Uh, Goldman had a servicer. Um, you know, everybody wanted to be in the origination business because everybody wanted their own. They wanted to make fees. sure they had enough um, of the raw material from right. which they built these securities. Yeah. And, uh, and let me just say one thing uh, that, that, you know, you said that this was a shocking fact. We found it shocking ourselves. I hadn't realized, I really had not realized the extent to which Wall Street and the subprime companies were interconnected. It was, uh, it was a, 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 a major revelation to me. Yeah, and again, I think for those who want to blame Fannie and Freddie, although I, I don't like Fannie and Freddie, I think you, you cannot explain the financial crisis without explaining that phenomenon because it's, it is really, Yes, Fannie and Freddie brought some subprime securities. Did you 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 list them? You talk about the size of it. It, it was not trivial, but but it was not the cause of the problem. Like the, the underlying cause of the, the precipitating events came from Wall Street channeling trillions of dollars into lousy mortgages. Right, and and there's a. I also believe, by the way, that um, the crisis was greatly um, amplified by the creation of synthetic. Uh, the CDOs. Yeah, for sure. Because then you didn't need the raw material. Once you could make a synthetic. Explain what that was. Um, well, it, it's a collateralized debt obligation that doesn't hold actual subprime mortgages in it. It simply references mortgages that already exist. So once you created a synthetic product, that didn't that where well, you didn't need the raw material anymore. You're kind of betting on the bets. Yeah, is what I you, think of it. You could, and, and this actually did happen. A particular tranche uh, uh, or or a particular bond that the the shorts like John Paulson um, uh, felt sure were going to blow up would get bet on 15, 20, 30, 40 times. Everybody would say, I want, I want that tranche. And, and when they talk about the uh, famous abacus deal that Goldman did 
where John Paulson was on the short side and he allegedly helped pick the bonds. The reason that he was doing that is because he had a series of bonds in mind that he thought were really unusually bad, even the worst of the worst. And he was betting on those bonds as, as frequently and as in as many ways as he possibly could. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and and, and I, I personally believe that the, the rise of synthetics took what would have been a disaster and, and made it a crisis. Well, they certainly amplified it, as you said. Uh, so we have some smart like devils um, or semi devils maybe at Goldman. You've, you've faulted Rubin. You've faulted Greenspan. Uh, you want to list some angels, people who had the right idea? Somebody like Brooks Lee Bourne maybe is one of them uh, in your book. Who certainly, else? Josh, certainly Josh Rosner is another. Um, you know, I, I, I know this will make you slightly crazy, but I think that community activists who were t- screaming from the rafters about the problems with subprime loans uh, are a third. Um, Ned Gramlich at the Fed, who is the one person who went to Greenspan and said, we really ought to t- take a look at this, although he was such a diffident, uh, polite man, uh, he didn't have it in him to say anything uh, in an aggressive fashion and was very, very easy to dismiss. Um, I think John Bright, I mean, there's some people who could have been angels. Uh, you mentioned John Bright, the risk manager. The reason he's interesting, I think, unusually interesting in this case, is because um, he was somebody who, once the institution began taking on more risk than it should have, it didn't really want good risk managers looking over their shoulder trying to stop their deals. So he gets shunted aside and basically gets pushed off the trading floor and exiled onto another floor where he, he is not given access to, to data uh, that would have alerted him to the problem. And um, I suspect, you know, I didn't, we, you know, I suspect that happened at, at, at a lot of firms. I yeah. suspect that happened at Citi and UBS and, and all the firms that sort of dove in with both feet when it was too late. Yeah, and I think a lot of those folks either were shunted aside or just simply ignored. Uh, they were ruining the party. Yeah, that's right. They were the they were the skunk in the punch bowl. Yeah, let, let's talk about. I want to come back to Greenspan now, and the ideology issue, which um, I'm going to I'm going to give a slightly different interpretation and, and let you react to it. I certainly agree with you that Greenspan used free market ideology to defend his lack of regulatory oversight. I think it's an interesting question as to whether he really believed in it. And uh, for the following, he's certainly famous as an acolyte of Ayn Rand, and, and he's a famous libertarian as a result of that. But he didn't act like a libertarian, except when it was convenient, which was, as you've chronicled beautifully in the book, when people pressured him or made suggestions about oversight, he tended to re- reject them on ideological grounds. Uh, at least the, that was his public statement. The irony is, and for me, this is the way I defend uh, or at least keep my uh, ideology uh, somewhat sane. The irony is he was a lousy free marketer. He was, if anything, uh, a destroyer of capitalism. Forget his, forget his central banking policy, which you can debate whether that was just good or bad. And, and of course, John Taylor and others have, at Stanford have been very critical of his policies in the 2002 to 2005 period. And you mentioned how his low interest rates certainly encouraged subprimes or teaser rates, et cetera. The problem I have is this issue of moral hazard. He, involved with, with others, was instrumental in insulating Wall Street from, his, from the, the mistakes they made, whether it was the, um, the 1987 crash, whether it was the uh, the 95 peso crisis, whether it was the long-term capital management. So he's this pro-capitalist guy on paper, but in practice, he's subsidizing Wall Street like any other special interest group. So my creepy interpretation, which I don't think is uh, – I don't want to make it specific to him. I think it's specific to all the players. Uh, what they say about what they did is you know, one thing. What they did is they served their masters. They served the people in power who kept them in power, kept their benefits in place, whether they were secretaries of treasury or central bankers. And um, we got a problem with democracy in the United States for, and crony capitalism, not the real thing. What do you think? I, I, I guess I would have a difficult time disagreeing with that. Um, one of the things that I was struck by 
was rereading the famous article, uh, The Committee to Save the World, uh, on the cover of Time magazine in the late 90s. Yeah. It has Greenspan as, as front and center, and then he's flanked on one side by Rubin and on the other side by Larry Summers, who then was Rubin's dep- deputy and became Secretary of Treasury about six months later. Um, and <laughs> and resurfaces, that, resurfaces in the Obama administration. Right. And then the thing that, that, that I found so striking about that article is that they're just talking about, the, the author is talking about, you know, first they solve the Mexican crisis, then the Russian crisis, then the Asian crisis, then long-term capital management. It's like one after another, boom, 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 boom. And nobody steps back to ask, you know, why are we having all these crises? What is fundamentally <laughs> going wrong with the system? Yeah. And, and when they do ask that, the answer, he asks one question along this line, and the answer is just so glib. Um, and, and, and it's sort of more, more or less like, well, they're just not enough like us yet, yeah. which is just insane. And, and I, I've, I find myself pretty contemptuous. I mean, obviously I'm reading it 10 years later. But um, the lack of um, willingness to look sort of deeply at the framework that they had helped create and question whether it was actually doing the good that it was supposed to be doing, I thought was quite striking. Um, uh, the serve your master's notion, I, I don't know what I think about that. I'm, I'm probably too much of a centrist journalist to... Um, um, I guess people act subconsciously uh, uh, more than uh, we like to acknowledge, and, and you know... I don't think Greenspan was consciously thinking these are the steps I have to do to stay in power, but but you know maybe that was maybe that was a subconscious motivation. Yeah, I don't I don't mean to suggest anything sinister about it. I don't think he's any different than 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 either of us or anybody else who's right. especially in a position of power. I don't, and I think he believed what he said. I think he believed he was a free market uh, champion. I, I, Yes, I, I agree with that. And when um, he confessed on Capitol Hill, you know, this famous mea culpa that his worldview needs reexamining, he might have been sincere, but he should well, have looked earlier. <laughs> the, the, my my interpretation of that has to do with um, the 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 with modeling. I, I think one of the things that happened uh, over the course of the last twenty years is the uh, a, the core idea that you could model away risk. And I, I, one of the things that was striking in that apology was when he said, you know, several people have won Nobel Prizes for the work that has turned out to be flawed. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, I think that, and I also think this is, was Larry Summers' flaw to a large extent also, because Larry wants to believe that he's smarter than anybody else. Could and be. sort of believing in the mathematics of the model, I think, was part of trying to prove how smart you were. And... Um, uh, well, I've uh, certainly gotten a lot less uh, sanguine about economic modeling in the last five years, and uh, right. I think most smart people have, but not everybody. No, not everybody. And and but but you know, to to refer to John Bright again, I, one of the things that he says is that um, that that on Wall Street, what happened on Wall Street was that um, uh, they came to view modeling. Not as a reflection of reality or a uh, an approximation of reality that you know could be changed with different assumptions and so on, but they came to view it as reality itself. Yeah. So if you had a AAA security, um, even if it had sixty percent of its bonds were subprime mortgage bonds, um, you believed absolutely that it held no risk. And if you were a money market fund, you held it, which you know um, insanity. Yeah. <laughs> right, ultimately insanity. Because, uh, but as you point out, it's been engineered to be safe. It's like it's right. like a bridge. You don't you don't when you cross a bridge, when you walk across the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a, in theory a terrifying prospect because there's tons of metal crossing it with you. You don't get nervous because right. you know that smart people have looked into it and it's fine. Well, uh, we had uh, uh, MBIA in the offices of the New York Times last week. Who are they? Um, the big bond insurance company, which is you know has struggled mightily since the crash, uh, <laughs> to say the least. And one of the things that we said to them, we asked them about, was their models. And they said, well, actually, our models were pretty accurate. If we plugged in a 20% decline in housing prices, they showed the world blowing up. 
But we just assumed that that could never possibly happen. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so. well, there's this famous paper by the Orzog brothers and Joseph Stiglitz, who was a Nobel laureate, showing how remote it is that Fannie or Freddie would ever go bankrupt. That's, that's, that is absolutely true. And, um, you know, there's a lot of sort of embarrassing things like that out there that tend not to get uh, talked about these days. I mean, Gary Gorton is another person who has had a great career re- rehabilitation uh, writing a paper on the causes of the crisis that has been uh, Bernanke has actually praised, uh, and yet his role as the person who created the models for AIG's credit default swaps uh, seems to be forgotten. Yeah, well, I said a lot of stupid things, but fortunately no one was listening. I just have some embarrassing blog posts from the 2005 to 07 period. Um, let's talk about securitization going forward. One of the Again, I think one of the things that a reader learns from the book is the inherent complexity of securitization, the way it's spun innovatively and a little bit frighteningly into areas that weren't intended originally. Right. Certainly, were some were responses to regulations to, that they were trying to avoid. Others were responses to interest rates, et cetera. But what I find remarkable – is that people want to recreate it and get – we need to get back to the world where – and I'm, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that we are stuck with securitization whether we like it or not. Um, bank, banking is such that if we ever had to go back to a world where banks had to keep all the whole loans on their books, they wouldn't make any whole loans. They just wouldn't. Um, they won't uh, – you know, they can't function in a world where they're – you know they have to put that kind of capital aside, um, uh, which they would have to do under the rules. Um, the 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 problem with the securitization market right now is that nobody trusts it, and so nobody is willing to buy and wisely. Sell. Wisely, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, look. I mean, if you if you securitize prime mortgages, if you go back to what it used to be, and you're securitizing prime mortgages, and and with thirty, you know, that 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 with with prime borrowers, it probably is fine. Um, the problem is that the that the device became abused, uh, you know, dramatically abused. I, I don't think securitization per se is necessarily bad. I, I really don't. Um, I do think the abuse of securitization can be terrible. Um, uh, so, so, and, and I also think that in the world in which we live, uh, that if the housing market, just to take one example, this, the housing market, if the housing market is ever really going to get back on its feet again, one of the things that really needs to happen is that you need to have a healthy securitization market again. Because as I say, you know, the big banks, you're just not going to go back to a world where you walk into the bank where he looks you in the eye, you know, you put up your firstborn for collateral, you put down 25%, and, and, and you know, you send him your, your $2,000 a month. It, that that know, world doesn't work that way anymore. I know, but we know what that world looks like. It's called 1976 or so. And right. it was a pretty good world. Homeownership was lower, but really not that much lower. You know, as you it, actually wasn't, it actually wasn't that much lower. Yeah, That's a few one of the percentage points. Difference. Yeah, you know, it... it to me, the – let me ask the question a different way. Uh, when people tell me that, that Wall Street's a crucial part of the American standard of living because it allocates capital, I respond by saying, well, it could be, but it is, hasn't been for the last 10 years. I, I, well, I, first of all, I totally agree with you on that. Um, they're horrible uh, at it. You know, they're, they don't allocate capital well. I mean, just to take a completely something has nothing to do with securitization. If you look at the IPO market, you know, if they alloc- if they actually wanted to allocate capital, they would maximize the amount that goes to the companies instead of trying to maximize the amount that goes to the investor. Um, I mean, it's a terrible system. And then it's a cartel, so they take seven and a half percent off the top. Yeah, so I, to I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> I think they are terrible capital uh, allocators. Um, so the question uh, is, what do we do about it? So, what what, what would you do? What what suggestions do you have, if any? It's uh, it's a pretty tough question, obviously. But what, what do you think we could do to make it better? Uh, the securitization market, or no, the market? Wall Street in general. Well, uh, and the way it allocates capital. I mean, we just put a few trillion dollars into making sure everybody has two homes uh, or a large segment of the U.S. population. It's a bad idea. It's a right. bad decision. I, you know what? I, 
you got me. I, I don't really know what you can do. I do think, I mean, people talk a lot about real, realigning compensation incentives so that, you know, the good stuff gets rewarded. It's, it's just, I, I, I kind of think Wall Street's kind of hopeless at this point, that they've already gone back to the bad old ways yeah, uh, uh, they make money now, hand over fist. All they do is all they do is buy treasuries. Uh, <laughs> you know, they they borrow from the Fed at nothing and buy treasuries at three percent and pocket the difference. It's it's kind of absurd. Yeah, um, I don't know what the answer well, is. Let me ask you a question that we we touched on that's related to this, which is, and you write about it in the book briefly. Uh, you write about the episode where Goldman goes public in, I think, 99, 98, 98, yeah, I think. that's right. Um, they're one of the last investment banks to go public. Right. They have an illustrious history, an illustrious culture. But they were the last, but it was a very short window where most all, actually, almost all, uh, certainly all the major investment banks all went from being partnerships where they played with their own money and some of their customers to where they could play with investors' money. Um, I think that's part of the problem. The question is why it happened. I, you know, again, I worry about moral hazard and and government backstopping with my money as a taxpayer. But certainly, that change had something to do with this problem. Oh, there's no question about it. Once the partner's money was not at stake, you could take. They were much more willing to take risks that they would never would have taken with their own money. There's there's no question. But then the issue then becomes well. If if they had not gone public and they had not increased their capital base, would they have been swamped by Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse and the and the big European banks yeah. that didn't have Glass Steagall type rules? That you know, it, 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 that's what makes it so difficult to grapple with. The world it wasn't just the U.S. The world was changing. And, you know, remember the fears that the Japanese banks were going to take, all, take us all over, and now there's some fears about the Chinese banks? And, yeah. Uh, that, so the, they felt a justifiable need to get big so that they could compete on a global scale. And the, 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 the unintended consequences of that meant that you increased the moral hazard um, by a hundredfold because... Risk taking became something that did. If you if you took a risk and you were wrong, it didn't come out of your pocket. Yeah, what, a, I, what a difference! It came out of your shareholders' pocket, and who cares about the shareholders? Yeah, and they were rolling the dice. They did really well for a long time. They uh, did. And I think the you know the argument that they'd be swamped by Deutsche Bank and others that's the argument they want us to believe. The question is, and I think it's a, it's a tough question, but I think this, the real question is: Does the world need American investment banks? Um, as I come back to this question of Wall Street allocating capital, uh, I once talked – I'm not going to name him, but a prominent writer and policymaker who who was just horrified at the thought that if Goldman disappeared and its role was taken over by Deutsche Bank or some other country with a foreign name in its title, and my thought was, so what? I, I don't mind using a, a Finnish cell phone. I don't have one, but I wouldn't mind using a Finnish cell phone, Nokia. Why should I care whose name is on the people who allocate the capital if they do it wisely? And when they do it poorly, I don't have to pay for it. Let the, let the Germans pay for it. I'm not uh, necessarily hostile to that argument, although I guess what I would say in response is that um, I don't think it's a matter of national security or anything like that, but, <laughs> I'd also, but I do think that Wall Street – generates a lot of jobs, and, and even if it generates wealth for its own pocket, um, you know, I live in New York. I mean, if, if Wall it's good for your It's good for your if, condo. <laughs> if, if Wall Street disappeared tomorrow, this would be a very different city. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but the, that's not an argument. <laughs> the argument I'm making has nothing to do with allocation of capital, as you rightly point out. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a great example. Um. What do you think is we're, – we're almost out of time. What do you think is yet to be written? There have been, a, you're, you're, there have been so many books already, and of course there will be more written on this crisis, some at the micro level about any, you know, an individual firm. Some are more are broad and overarching as yours was. Um, what do you think – what's the stories – what are some of the stories that, you're not, that you can give away uh, that you're not working on that you think have yet to be told that people are going to work on in the future or that you think are important? Well, I – I think the future of housing is hugely important, and I think that it is going to be 
you know, on the one hand, it's going to be fought out in Washington on an ideological basis, i.e., what do we do about Fannie and Freddie? But more importantly, I, I, I feel very strongly that we have become a country utterly dependent on the federal government. Uh, the housing market is now completely dependent on the federal government. And how the story of how this country tries to figure out how to create a private housing market, I think is a really, really important story for the future of this country. But I guess today has been Joe Nocera. Joe, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you very, very much. This was really fun. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.